Okay, uh, Rory Fitzpatrick is CEO of the National Space Center here in Cork, a world-class carrier-grade commercial teleport and center of excellence for space research. Uh, he is a 20-year veteran of the satellite communications industry, and Rory very strongly believes in the enterprise culture and the ability of the Irish space sector to stimulate economic growth and lead development of space technologies in both space and terrestrial applications. Really looking forward to hearing uh, your talk, uh, Rory, uh, I'll be back with some questions and answers. And, and we want to hear from you folks. Don't forget, uh, questions are in the Q&A uh, of the uh, stage. And if you ask them, um, we'll get to as many as we can. Like the ones you like as well. We had 332 people on yesterday, 220 in networking, huge amount of people engaging. That's what we want here. So get your questions in for Rory. Rory, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And thanks very much for the TechFest team for inviting me along to talk this morning. It's funny, Jonathan saying that uh, the 20 years, I wish it was only 20 years. I was over in California last year and I had the depressing reality of going to the Mountain View to the Computer Museum and realizing I've lived through the entire museum. Now, it's not often you get to live through a museum, but I remember from the first computer to where we are now, and, and it really, really hit me hard. So um, I'm CEO of the National Space Centre. I'm down here in Elfordstone and Middleton. Um, we like to see the Southwest and Munster as the space capital of Ireland. Um, I'm going to give you a quick look here before I go into my slideshow presentation of the big dish, which is uh, our beast on the roof. I don't know, can you see that? It's, it's a monster, it's a 32 meter standard A antenna, and it was built originally to take telephone traffic from Europe to America. Um, it's a great, great fun place to come to work every day. So I'm gonna just pop up um, my slideshow now for you. Um, now this will take a second just to get live. There we go. So, um, as I said, my name is Roy Fitzpatrick, National Space Center. The presentation is talking about the future is now. Uh, and, and this really, really is going a little bit through um, the Earth observation about us, Earth observation and comms, which is our key area of expertise on, on geosynchronous satellites, low orbit satellites and mid orbit satellites. But I'm going to give you a flavor of examples of their use. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the future and how we're there now. So the first one is... Elphiston, built in 1984 to take telephone traffic from Europe to America. And the reason we were picked here is we're the most westerly part of Europe. And to link to America, Cork has better infrastructure and viewing platform than Dublin or anywhere else in Ireland, uh, hence the space capital of, uh, of Ireland. Um, you see the big dish and there's a backup dish down on the bottom. We also have ranging stations and various other dishes for commercial clients um, on site that operate right through the spread of various different satellites, but it's all basically in the Leo, Geo and Mio areas. Um, so the, the three different types. So I'm gonna show you a, a, um, a video now that gives you a really, really strong visual um, uh, idea of where they are and why they are the way they are. So this, this is an ESA video and it shows, starts off with the Earth and with your mid Earth orbit satellites going around. Um, as we slowly come out of this, it'll start bringing in the geos around in a big, huge ring. And you can see those all floating 26,000 kilometers out from the equator. They're brilliant for satellite TV, for beaming stuff in, for um, some point-to-point uh, -point stuff, but mainly that's broadcast. And then as we come in close to the Earth and we get into the tidal orbits to, to the 300 to 600 uh, miles up, you, they're whipping around really fast going uh, around the globe. And they're the ones that give you low latency, um, video, uh, infrared, uh, the various different sensors that pick up all kinds of space data from the Earth. Uh, and also the most recent ones, which I'll be going to in more, in more detail in a minute, is the communications via low orbit satellite. And it's a real game changer. This is a huge thing. One of the things you'll notice here is the amount of stuff in space. Space debris is a big issue. Um, we were up over in Russia um, with the Ru Russian Space Agency, and they are terrified uh, that one of their rockets with a manned mission will be hit by a piece of space debris because the video you saw a minute ago is just the satellites. There's also 600,000 pieces of space junk flying around there. And obviously, when you have a piece of space junk going at 100,000 kilometers a second and you have the, the mass uh, of that by the, 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 the volume, by the speed, 
the mass of that is, in, is, is insane. And if it hits the space station, it'll blow to pieces. So the space station last year moved about three or four times to allow for space debris that was coming up. So this, this is one of the really big areas we have going forward. This um, image that you see right now is the Starlink network. And this is where SpaceX have their network right now. You can see the long lines of them that have just been launched. And these have just been spat out of a, a, a launch vehicle. Uh, and those spacecraft are in a nice tight line and they'll spread out. And I'll show you that in a graph in more detail when I deal with SpaceX. And this gives you a visualization of the orbits. So you can see the big ring, which is the two orbits. And you can see summer and winter when the world is tilting. You can see there's two lines uh, and there's kind of a band between the two of them. So that's where all the geos sit. Uh, and as I said, they're broadcast television, they're, uh, they're kind of anything where you want to send a signal to the whole continent or to a large country, that's where you want to be. And um, so the next one is the mid orbit. And you can see the center ring there, some of the mid orbit ones and into the tighter orbit. So, so the low orbit is the ones that we really want to deal with um, today. So examples of their uses. Well, this was a very interesting one uh, and a very strange one. People really didn't expect this is a gravity globe. So this gives you an idea of the different gravity densities around the world. We think of it as a sphere, but you can see the shape of the gravity there is a very different shape. Now, this has massive effects on airlines, on computers, on, on everything that we do. Anything that has magnetic uh, properties or, or influences, it hits here. You can see over Ireland, we're, we're on a very, very heavy gravity hotspot. Um, now, I don't know, does that mean we get shorter? I don't know. <laughs> it could be. Um, the next one we have is is really a key driver. This is the temperature map. Now, the temperature of the ocean sets the weather for the globe. It, it really is the barometer of what's going on. And the really big problem for us is the temperature here. All, you can see the line of heat across the ocean. That line of heat is showing the areas that there's problems going forward. And this is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. We see the last two years, we've really had a massive acceleration of forest fires in California, forest fires across Europe and this summer is going to be no different there's going to be big problems this summer because the temperature has not gone down and it means that every year we're going to have an escalation of the amount of forest fire burning and the issue and it'll spread so right now across the whole of Europe Spain Portugal across to Romania these are going to be flashpoints Greece we saw Greece a couple of years ago this was a big issue this then goes into the more detailed satellite imagery that's used on the ground. So if you're trying to manage dealing with fires, you have to know where the fire is spreading, which way the winds are coming from. The more information you can take from satellite, the better you're able to deal with these crises on the ground. And fire is a really, really important one because it, it, it jumps, it spreads quickly, it runs out of control, and, and it's very easy for firefighters to get trapped within fire. And, and many of them have lost their lives trying to rescue people's houses doing this. Uh, there's another one which gives you a bigger picture cut back out. And this is showing the, the, the hot and the cold areas and where the hot spots are. Again, you will pick up stuff on this that you don't even know is happening. Um, you, you know, you, you'll have local people ring in fires. But this kind of thing, remote areas, if there's a fire picking up and it's heading towards an area, you can start tracking remotely. Uh, the next one is a weather one. Uh, and this, again, it's something we've become so used to. This weather shows where the flooding is. It tracks the rain clouds and it tracks the way things are moving up so that the flood defense people can plan where the problems are going to be. If they know there's going to be a huge uh, raindrop in one county where there's a certain amount, uh, type of topography, they can plan to maybe empty the dams early to store more water. The, this is real-time environmental planning and management. And, and it's a critical part of the day-to-day -day stuff. Now, we, we know this only too well in Cork, where a couple of years ago, they held back the dam uh, because they were searching for a dead body in the river. And then they ended up flooding Bandon because there was such heavy flood water, the dam was getting under pressure and they had to release water on the top of a high tide with, uh, with a, a low pressure. So all the things came together in one moment to create a super high tide. Um, this is examples of the flood information that the environmental planning agencies will be using. So th this is key information for them. Again, various different satellite sensors. The more sensors they have, the more information they have, the more layers they can put up, the more they can make a, an informed and smart decision. And this kind of stuff, sometimes people don't take it seriously because it's only flooding someone's garden. But, but a bad flood can create serious loss of life, um, the property and life. So, so from the authorities' point of view, this is critical. 
Um, we have a lot of friends of mine sail and they're involved in water sports. This gives you an idea nowadays of how good we are. And you can see Hurricane Laura starting to come in. Now, if you were living in any of the islands along here, this is huge. If you have six or eight hours or 20 hours in advance notice or maybe two or three days uh, with some of the new stuff, you can plan, you can board up your house, you can move somewhere safe. If a hurricane hits you without being prepared, that's when you have real, real, real problems. And that's when you have real loss of life. Um, now we go into some of the Irish examples. Um, for us, algae bloom and plankton off the west coast is a big thing. This is why Irish fishing is such a beautiful area, is that you can see off our west coast, there's a massive amount of algae bloom, and the temperature of the water there brings in fish plankton that the fish feed on, that the bigger fish feed on, and so on, right through the chain. We just need to make sure it's not overfished and that this doesn't become a, a, a depleted stock area. And again, for me, I windsurf and I like to sail. So these new products that I can see uh, with WindGuru and Windy and all these, they're all taking satellite data, dropping it in and, and running throughout the other side with these, uh, with these services. So I, I'm going to run on now into Starlink because I'm under pressure on time. So Starlink, the, the, we, um, Starlink is SpaceX's system. It arrived in December. Um, we put it up on the roof, got it up and running, and I also got a test system at home. So these are the, the boxes that are the, the domes that communicate to the satellite. They're up in the top building in sight, and they've been running since January. This is the one at my house. This is a little modem that bings up to the satellite and takes down broadband. The network, you can see there that Ireland is in a sweet spot up on the top in 52 north, and 52 south is where this runs to. Right now, there's 1,600 satellites up, but they're planning a huge number of satellites. Depending on what you're looking at, it, it really is a vast number. Now, the, these are the planned times. So this is two years old or a year old, this presentation. These were the planned times that they'd bounce from New York to London and back to Ireland. The reality is a very slick product. Usually, I would discount the stuff that they're selling in advance of a product hitting the market, and I would say, oh, yeah, maybe it will work a little bit, but this really, really does deliver. I have um, that you've seen that slide. I have this is from my house on Sunday night and the average speed I'm getting. You see there it's 94 uh, megs. That's landed speed and 56 up. What I'm getting at the moment in the house and it's been tested for three months now is between 80 and 120 megs up and between 50 and 80 down. So that's really, really slick product. And it's the first time satellite has delivered a low latency product. And the low latency makes a huge difference for a lot of the uses. So um, like gaming, gaming was never an option via satellite. Web tunneling and using remote desk options was never an option via satellite because just the speed of light getting up to the geo and back down took too long. So this, this was a very, very quick way of doing it. This system is, is the job. It's, it's the first comparable system to fiber. Scary thing here is we look at the numbers. Right, so we, we just this is just a snapshot of the company's planning. Starlink, 42,000 planned. China, 12 and a half. OneWeb, six and a half. You go down through the list. This doesn't include Apple or a load of the other companies that are talking about it. It doesn't mention any Japanese. It doesn't mention any Indian. There will be a load more. You could have hundreds of thousands of satellites up there in a couple of years' time. And this is huge because only two, three years ago, the entire satellite market was about six and a half thousand satellites. And we're going to go from that to maybe 100,000 satellites. It, you know, th this is going to be an issue. Space debris and the noise up there and the amount of craft up there is going to become a monster problem going forward. So that's the technical side of my platform, uh, my presentation, just to talk very, very briefly about the future. Um, my, my belief is that we're here now. I grew up in the early 80s when we were kind of prehistoric. We had the first computers, we were playing around with them. But things are starting to accelerate at such an amazing pace. If you look at this, this, this is now. Last year, this was at a show in Paris. It's an autonomous vehicle. They're there, they're now. This is not something that we're thinking about in the future. The next one, yes, I adore. Over. This is Roger. so exciting and sexy. I used the water jetpack one, and it's fantastic. It's really awesome. I can only imagine the like this. And you know, you look at Iron Man, fictitious Hollywood movie stuff. This guy is the lead Iron Man, Richard Aaron, uh, Richard Brown. And, and he, he does this all over the place. My Navy is one of the big contracts that he's doing. That's the first generation of suits that they've got. Within five years, I reckon you'll be able to buy these for about five grand. And that is mad. That's 
we will be able to check back around the place in five years. Ago. Next one, and this one was one of the sexiest moments in space uh, in the last couple of years. And Musk, he, to be fair to him, he drives a hard, uh, a, a hard kind of uh, team and, and he pushes the envelope to the edge. But for me, when you look at growing up with Star Trek and Star Wars and all the science fiction and stuff like that, this moment where you get a synchronized dual landing and reuse of the vehicles was that for me is the moment of the decade, right? It's like the Wright brothers with their first flight. This will be a moment in history that's that's taken forward. And then, of course, the other huge moment in the last decade, us flying a drone on another planet. This is, we're very, very, very close to being an interplanetary species. And this step is so vast, it's such a huge thing. It's, it's a really, really big deal that we're able to go from our own planet to another planet. It, it, and, and we almost did it, we went to the moon, we realized how seated the pants it was, we came back, we reorganized, we rebuilt, we redesigned, our technology has improved tremendously. And now we're able to do this at a level where we can repeat it again and again and again. And that's the sexy thing, is that it's not that we're doing this on a 10% chance it might work. This was something that was planned where they wanted a, a guarantee that it would work. They wanted to know it would work. And, and the technology is there now to do that. So we are going to be launching into space very, very shortly with people, manned missions to Mars. Uh, within our lifetimes, we may see the first Martian being born. And for me, that's a really, really sexy thing. Um, the next one, and this, this is what I get a giggle out of. When we look at technology and Monster Technical University and all the stuff that's going on in the space coast and in, in the capital of space being Cork, Enverno, uh, Enverno is a Cork-based cryptocurrency. My son came to me this last week and I just thought, what? There's someone in Cork, a, a young guy in Prez in uh, one of the schools in Cork in fifth year is after writing a cryptocurrency to do environmental stuff with trees. And my son is after buying, they're all, they're all now planning on buying Teslas and everything else with the money they make out of the Cork crypto. So keep an eye on that. It's going to be a fun one to watch. So that's, that's the presentation. Uh, my, my, my really big thing here is space is now. And for people that want to get involved, for young people out there that are interested in space, there is so much coming down the line. Space is going to be a $4 trillion industry in the next five to 10 years. That's a huge, vast growth industry, and it's exciting, and it's sexy, and it's fun. And if you want to get involved, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Just write to companies, track them on LinkedIn, start connecting, get into the uh, network, become part of the network if you're interested. It's easy. All you have to do is go onto LinkedIn and start talking to people. It's, an, it's a very open community because most of the people in this community are in it because they love it and they're interested. So, so it's a much more open industry than a lot of other industries. Um, and there's also a lot of other things going on. For me personally, my biggest uh, kind of moment in my career, and, and sadly, like we said in the beginning, I've lived a long time in this, 40 years in, in, in technical industry. Having dinner with Buzz Aldrin was a real sweet spot for me. He was so much fun. He, he, he reminds me of a cranky cowboy, um, tough as nails, but brilliant, really sharp. Um, and of course, the other thing is, how often do you get to come to work with Star Wars? We had, we had these guys on site last year and it, it was fantastic. Michael Fitzgerald, well done. So the, the last thing I have here is for anyone who's interested in getting involved in space and in, in pushing it out there, um, Cassini Hackathon, uh, this is something that we're running on site with MTU. Niall, Dr. Niall Smith, in fact, the first guy who pushed SpaceX with us going way back, um, he, he was telling us about SpaceX long before it existed and, and this uh, long before we got involved anyway um, and, and now getting involved with MTU the exciting thing for us with MTU is that they have hands on engineering their, their guys are from the network right through to the other side and it really for industry is a fantastic thing so the whole Southwest has a massive bonus in having MTU based down here um, and, and that's it really so thank you very much. Um, I, I now hand back over to to Jonathan and uh, and I'm available for questions. Rory, it's great to see someone uh, with such enthusiasm uh, still, you know, even in their 40s, still managing to be so enthusiastic <laughs> about their, um, their work. And you know what? You really touched on something that uh, 
that it is absolutely true about the space industry. They are very open. These, um, the space industry in, in Ireland, but also internationally, um, they all want people to be as excited about them as that technology. And Ireland is, as you say, in this really exciting place. David McKeown and his team in UCD um, mm -hmm. launching AirSat-1, uh, you know, the first Irish satellite going into space. Um, AirSat-2 is also in development. And there's lots of these companies trying to figure out what to do um, and how to how to make money and and and, and experiment uh, in in space. It's really really exciting. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to be in French Guiana for the launch of the Sentinel One uh, satellite, which I, I remember when they were giving me some of the details. It was absolutely mind blowing, and and it really the the sort of overview these satellites give us. Um, there's, there's so much opportunity there. I remember them talking about the, the, the quality of the image they're getting from these satellites would allow them to detect one millimeter of subsidence in houses on the tube uh, routes in, in London. And that's really exciting. So th this sort of technology is, is a lot of the time it's, it's, it's available to us for companies listening to this right now. What, what do you think they should be looking out for? Because it's, it's, it's lying on the ground, this data in a way, because we paid for it as European citizens. And there's lots of opportunity, isn't there? Um, the, the, the really, really exciting thing here uh, compared to a lot of other countries that we've been to is Enterprise Ireland. Uh, and it, they have a difficult job because it's hard to get startups in, a, in an area that's a new area. Yeah. Now, when we first looked at this, Tony McDonald took us by the hand and led us through. And, and he, he really is magnificent. Tony is, is, uh, is our guy in Enterprise Ireland. And we've got Connor Sheehan and Brian Rogers. There's a large team of them up there. And they've been pushing space for the last 10 years. Yeah. Now, it's been a long slog for them because it takes time for companies to get a, a name and build a network. And Ireland is just beginning. We've 90 Enterprise Ireland. We're an Enterprise Ireland company ourselves. Like That's the, one of the key things that helped us start. And, and when we come from there and you're starting to work through, we've got 90 space companies in Ireland now, tree metrics and on the local company using space technology to, to manage trees. You know, the, in, bio, in bio, there's a lot of Irish companies starting to make name internationally and to build that network. Yeah. So I, if anyone's interested, get onto the Enterprise Ireland website and, and start communicating with the lads and they will get help. Obviously, the Irish strategy, and, and this is one of the key things with the, the, the space growth uh, plan, we don't have infrastructure here. Like, we're lucky with the big dish. It's a big, huge piece of infrastructure, but it's a legacy thing from the 80s. Mm. It wouldn't be viable to build that in Ireland now. So most of the Irish money is being put into downstream projects to use data for other companies. So if you have a company out there that's doing anything, harvesting hedges, if you can find a satellite application for that, you can get grant aid from ESA uh, for projects. So, so that's one of the key things that they're looking at is trying to get other companies sucked in. Yeah, and, and I, I've, I've, I'm hearing about forestry companies who are um, who are helping uh, uh, forest management agencies to see what's happened um, uh, in much better detail than you would be able to do by going and exploring that forest uh, just by using these satellite uh, images. It's, you're absolutely right. There, there's lots of applications uh, if mm -hmm. you work with land or if you work in the sea, I know um, piracy is another one of these applications that's spotting um, pirate, piracy uh, on the seas. Um, there's a question here, as a student studying computer science, what areas of computer science are looked for in candidates who wish to go into a career in space technology? <laughs> well, I'm not entirely the best one. Like my last exam is my junior cert. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you don't necessarily need to have a science degree. I, like, it's actually not as important what you study. Yeah. Um, it's more important that you're interested in getting into this area. And the reason why is because if you look, if you look at our company, across our company, there's one scientist, one engineer um, uh, for every accountant and salesman. And so every company has a spread of people through the whole rambit. So the, the science piece of it is just one piece. So you don't need to do science to get into space. Yeah. Um, we, we actually had a very funny one here. We had a presentation with uh, one of the American pilot, uh, American astronauts, um, Dan, oh God, Dan Johnson. And he, he, when he gave the presentation, they asked him, they said, you know, what did you study in school? And he said, I played football. And they were saying, <laughs> oh, okay. And, and he went from being a footballer to being a pilot. And then he became a test pilot. And then he became the guy who flew the shuttle. Yeah. So he was fly the shuttle up and he said that none of the scientists would leave him near the experiments. <laughs> but he, he made up his own experiment in his base called the Skittle experiment, where he burst open a bag of Skittles and whoever could grab the most of them in zero gravity won the game. 
So that was his contribution to the. <laughs> the yeah. I, and I, I think it's a really important point because people, I think, get intimidated by the idea of space, thinking because we've mm. we've built up these amazing engineers and and scientists and pilots uh, as being almost superhuman. That that people think, oh, I couldn't do that. But actually, there is, you know, uh, it's just like sports. You know, you don't need to be, you know, uh, messy. Uh, to to be involved in sports, you can do physio. You can you yep. can design the, the the kits. There's so much if you're into it, and uh, that community that is really really open to it. So I would say if you're interested in space and the applications of satellites, I just start asking questions. You'd be surprised what you can find. Uh, and a lot of it, a lot of it is simple. A lot of it is simple engineering. You know, like like rocket science. It, it, the, the, there's a lot of very advanced parts to it, but at the same time, there's a lot of very very hardcore simple engineering to it. Yep. Um, and this is the MTU thing. This is one of the really really big things. When we have guys down, we we have always taken people from MTU even before we got involved in in working with them on the development of this whole space uh, area. And the reason why is because if I get a guy down from there, he's generally got a good mechanical background. He can take apart an engine and rebuild it. He, you know, he understands the physical side of it as well as the yeah. theory. Yeah. Um, and that's a key thing. And when you're asking about the kind of areas they want, if you want to look at satellites, you've got physics, you've got uh, geophysics, you've got engineering, you've got chemicals. There's there's a whole host of areas that all feed into it. Mm. Um, every sensor that goes up is a slightly different sensor. And if you're interested in that area, you'll need to be a specialist in that field. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And, and the, but as you're right, there's this opportunity for specialists and there's opportunities for generalists. Um, uh, yeah. Rory, I could speak with you all day, Rory Patrick from National Space Center. Thank you so much for your time today. Fantastic talk and amazing feedback from from people loving the satellite imagery. Uh, imagery. I'm not sure about the Martian baby, but um, but everything else. Well, uh, Actually, you know what? before you go, that one last thing. This is a really, really, really big deal. We haven't had a baby born in space yet. Yeah. And and to be, we can technically we can deliver flying people up and back, but unless we can reproduce in space, we're going nowhere. So <laughs> it's a big deal. Yeah. All right, Rory. Thanks very <laughs> much. <laughs> Rather you first than me, uh, Rory Fitzpatrick. Everyone.